dwells in humanity, kneels in humility, and washes our feet. Oh, what a mystery, meanness and majesty, bow down and worship.
Perfect timing. Oh, good. Good evening, everybody. It's uh, really good to welcome you here this evening. If I haven't uh, seen you yet today, uh, let me just uh, wish you a happy Easter. Uh, hope it's been a, a good day for you. Praise God for Easter Sunday. Praise God for good weather uh, on Easter Sunday as well. Hopefully, uh, some of you can join us uh, tomorrow at uh, about two o'clock at the pier at Southwold. I better tell you which pier it is, haven't I? Um, <laughs> Southwold Pier. And uh, we're going to meet at about two. And what we tend to do is we walk. You walk as far as you can or you wheel, whatever is convenient for you, or you drive. And we go up to the harbour and about sort of 3.30 or so, we'll meet there and have, uh, have fish and chips at one of the, the restaurants there. Some people start, just get fish and chips along the way. Some people don't. That's fine, whatever, you know. It's good, but good to be great to see you uh, all there. Um, I just want to let church members know that we have the rescheduled, rescheduled church business meeting, God willing, planned for uh, the 28th of uh, this month. That's, th that's Thursday the 28th, half past seven, and that'll be at the church. We've got prayer meeting this week, also at the church, half past seven be really good to see you there if you can we've got a ton of stuff to be praying for you know not just the, the, the things that are happening in the world around us but we need to be praying don't we for just for the you know the movement of, of God's spirit in the hearts and the minds of not just ourselves to revive us but the hearts and minds of those that we've been reaching out to there was a visit to first time people in church this morning at least in this church and uh, uh, we're just praying that God will do a great work aren't we and um you know, we're, we're, we're blessed, we're encouraged. Pray for uh, what's been going on at uh, Taylor Road this afternoon. I haven't heard. Any, uh, Mark, were you, Dawn, were you at uh, Cafe Church? Did you have anyone in today? Yeah, good, yeah. good, yeah. excellent. Did the Mark and Louise and the family come back? Brilliant. Turning into t twice a Sunday, aren't they? Brilliant. <laughs> like it. Excellent. Good. Praise God for that. Listen, um, they, they, this pile of life magazines hasn't really gone down at all, so... Um, Paul, you need to take one of these because um, it's got a word search on the back. Oh. All right? <laughs> Do take one of those. Recipes? Oh. What? No. no. Pauline, recipes? <laughs> There's a stack of no, some testimonies, all sorts of stuff in there. So take one. They're free. And um, other stuff on the back as well. Please do that. I'm just going to divest myself of all the things that are in my pockets. We're going to, um, oh, well, I'll pray for us. Then uh, we'll, we'll stand and just sing a hymn together. Heavenly Father, we want to praise and thank you for a wonderful, wonderful day. Lord God, it may well be that our day personally hasn't been that wonderful. Um, it may be that we've struggled today. Um, it, it may be that we're not feeling well today or whatever. But Father God, it's still a glorious day because it's Resurrection Sunday. And Lord, we are just reminded that the greatest day in history is has happened and there's 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 a greater day coming when Jesus you'll come back to take us to, to home to be with you for for all eternity but that greatest day uh, has happened death has been defeated life is uh, is available in Jesus Christ so father we thank you for today and lord as we come back again on a another easter sunday evening we we do ask you to come amongst us as we look into your word for a little while as we sing some songs and hymns together Lord God, please, uh, please bless us and uh, come amongst us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's uh, stand and sing our first hymn together. <clears throat>
as I've been uh, studying uh, this last week for Easter Sunday and for what we want to listen to and what we think, want to think about, it might be an obvious thing to say, but the more you read the Old Testament, you, the more you just realise it's just laced with the good news that Jesus Christ is alive. That resurrection story, that word life, which has been our focus and our mission, our theme, hasn't it, for this last uh, six weeks or so. It's that, that, this life concept is just laced throughout the, the whole of the scriptures. I just want to read uh, a passage of scripture to you, uh, just to give you an example of that, a flavor of that. Let me just read some verses from Romans chapter 5 and then into chapter 6. This is Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and I'm just going to uh, read, uh, well, I'm going to read on into verse 6, and um, we'll, we'll see how far we get. But I'm going to start in chapter 5 of Romans, uh, verse 12, chapter 5, verse 12, if you want to follow along, otherwise... Uh, do just uh, listen. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so, the, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, here's the Easter story, being raised from the dead, will never die again. That's what we're looking at this morning, the difference between resurrection and revival. Death no longer has dominion over him. For death he died, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Don't present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. I'll see a little bit later how this New Testament message of life and death fits through the whole of the New Testament. And we're going to be going back uh, actually to those last words that Jesus spoke. We're going to be going back to Good Friday when the Lord Jesus Christ cried out in a loud voice, 
Uh, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But we're going to be looking at what that means for us in the context of, of life, spiritual life. You know what, you, you either are this evening spiritually, are, spiritually dead or spiritually alive. But we've just read about the wonderful doctrine of justification by faith alone. And it's that, that wonderful work of Christ Jesus on the cross that justifies us, that frees us from the guilt that ensnares us and imputes to us the, the wonderful radical righteousness of, of Almighty God, the righteousness of Christ Jesus. And so we'll see that uh, a little bit later as we look into the, the scriptures together. We're going to stand and sing again right now. It's just a, a real day to remember, isn't it, Easter Sunday, that uh, throughout the world the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ has been proclaimed in churches all over our region, all over the world. And, um, you know, we, we all know churches locally that we, uh, we're friendly with, we have an affection for, perhaps got loved ones, friends, family there, whatever. And uh, perhaps some of those have been on your mind today. You've been praying for pastors uh, there may be people back where you came from. Um, you've been thinking of churches back there. And uh, perhaps also uh, on a, a day like today, our mind goes again, doesn't it, to those parts of the world where life is just tough at the moment. We think again of uh, the, the Christian church in, in Ukraine. Uh, we think of the church in, uh, indeed, the, the, the Christians in Russia as well, don't we? We pray for them. We're reminded uh, about uh, the real life experience uh, that they're, they're having, Bob and 
Jackie Dobb spoke to us a couple of weeks ago about uh, uh, the couple of folks he met, one from Ukraine and one from Russia. So we want to pray for, for those churches, don't we, uh, that the message of, of peace uh, would, would spread and would encourage and build up. The other church that uh, has just been brought to my attention recently, actually, is a, a church that w we probably won't know because uh, it's over in Swansea in Wales, but we will know some of the folks that go there, Emma and, and Aham, um, uh, uh, Bob and Jackie's uh, family. We've met Emma and, and Aham. Aham works for the, the International Church in Swansea uh, alongside the full-time Baptist pastor there, uh, Pastor Injit, who's South Korean. Uh, I think, um, and uh, we were just saying how exciting it is to have a South Korean pastor. Um, it's uh, it, yeah, I, when I was at Bible College, there was a lot of South Koreans, and uh, to see South Koreans worshiping and praising and uh, you know leading is quite a joy to behold. It really is. Um, church over in South Korea is, is is revived and well. I'm pleased to report it's uh, it's it's a great thing to to behold. But um, over there, because as you'll know, a lot of refugees, uh, when they come into the United Kingdom, end up in Wales, end up in the cities in, in Wales. And at the international church there, Bob has been explaining to me, uh, a lot of folks go there. They get, so they've got Ukrainians there, they've got Russians, they've got, uh, got people from all over the world, Nigerians uh, there, um, Muslims going along there, uh, people of other faiths are going there um, because they find a welcome and a community, and they're here in a Christian a Christian message, and um, Bob was telling me as well that one of the things that they do there is actually just have a time of open prayer, uh, but not like our times of open prayer where we kind of sit quietly and politely, but they all pray out loud at once in their own language, talk about speaking in tongues, that's kind of biblical, I think, I don't think we can get away with, away with that, that's, that's, that's true, uh, true language, uh, the global church praying together. So let's pray for, for Pastor Injit as well tonight, and uh, Certainly, what an important time it is to, to be uh, an international church as uh, people from all over the world are coming to the United Kingdom. Um, uh, what an opportunity we have. Let's just pray, shall we, for a, uh, a couple of minutes. Father God, we thank you for the church. We thank you that the church is bigger than uh, anything this Baptist church is doing, although we praise you for what you're doing here uh, at this time. We praise you that here this morning, this this place was overflowing. Um, Lord, I've heard news of other churches where, which were full today. Of our old church at Bradford and Ruffham, the church there full and the gallery full. Lord, it's just so exciting to, to hear that people are coming to, um, to worship you on Easter Sunday. We do pray that whether it's here or in Bradfield or in Bury St Edmunds, Norwich, uh, Cambridge, whether it's anywhere in our country or in Swansea, Father God, that, Lord, in this country, the good news of the resurrected Saviour, the resurrected Jesus, would impact hearts and lives in a real powerful way today. Lord God, we pray that over these coming days, your church would be much in prayer for the, the, the work of proclamation of the gospel that's been going on Good Friday, yesterday and today, all over, all over our our country. Lord, we thank you for the church international as well, as well, the global church, Lord. We thank you that even in our own country, there is the global church gathers, Lord. We thank you for the church uh, in Swansea. Lord, this is a church that I, I, didn't, I, I didn't know anything about until uh, I was reminded, well, this is Aham and Emma's church. This is where they are, their, their ministry is, and we've heard about that before uh, over there in Wales. And Lord, we pray for them as they've gathered today. I don't know if they're gathering again this evening, but Lord God, we do just bring them to you. We bring the pastor and the leadership team there uh, to you. And we ask that, Father God, as people from all nations gather, uh, that Lord, those who are gathering perhaps in a Christian church for the first time, would Lord come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. Uh, and that would happen, Lord, even, even today through the preaching of your word, the good news of the gospel. Lord, we recognise that for many it's been a difficult day to gather in church. It may be that some, some people have not had a church to gather in today because their church has been blown apart or burnt to the ground. Father God, we ask that you would strengthen your people in countries of persecution, in countries of war and devastation. 
Lord, we do particularly pray for those whom we know and have been praying through it for already in, in Ukraine. Lord, we were reminded by Clive a couple of weeks ago of, of uh, pastors and churches uh, working in Ukraine through the work of Slavic Gospel Association. Lord, we think of the European Missionary Fellowship as well, uh, working out uh, in that part of the world. And Lord, we think of uh, those who many in the church will know, like uh, Cornell and Anna, Lord, who have been working so hard uh, getting uh, aid and support into churches for churches in Ukraine to distribute as needed, as well as taking refugees into Romania. Father God, at this time, Lord, may it be that the world looks on in wonder and sees that the church is alive, it is well, it is strong, it is growing. The gates of hell cannot prevail against, uh, against this work because, Lord God, the angel was sitting on the stone and no one, no one dared roll that stone back again. Uh, Father, the stone was rolled away, the, the, the grave was empty, Jesus wasn't there, he was alive. And Lord, we're, we're reveling in that message this evening. So Father, as we just sing again now, as we, as we then come and look into your word for a little while, be amongst us, be with those who are watching at home, online, be with those who can't be with us, who are away, a lot visiting family, some still are home with, uh, with illnesses of various sorts. Uh, Father God, we, we just thank you that we, we can just be aware of one another. Thank you for the fact that we can gather. Lord, thank you for the fact that for the first time in two years, we've been able to have a normal Easter day service. Lord, we're so blessed and we thank you for all you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand again, shall we? And uh, we'll sing. China cups. Are these new, Celia? Are these, uh, they had new stuff in the, in the hall? It's very posh here. Anyway, <laughs> my water. No, is that made for you, Donovan? <coughs> made for me. Yeah, yeah, I'm not posh. <laughs> <laughs> <My water. laughs> Give me your finger rubbing. Yeah. You say, I did, I 
some herbs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, turn back to uh, Luke's Gospel. And uh, we're going back to Good Friday for uh, a little while. I was uh, been asked several times today, what you're preaching on tonight. Are you, are you going to be preaching on the road to Emmaus? So it's, it's, <laughs> here on the road to Emmaus. I, I, I said, I think I've preached on the road to Emmaus so many times at this on an Easter Sunday evening. Um, I know it's kind of got to be done, but I thought we'd, we'd just do something a little bit different this evening. Uh, much as I love that account, um, which occurs uh, just at the end of this gospel. But we're in um, Luke chapter, where are we? Luke chapter 23. And uh, I'm just going to read verses 44 to 49. Luke 23, 44. It was about the sixth hour and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour when the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts, and all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Well, we looked at this saying, the seventh saying um, that Jesus spoke on Good Friday, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The title of the, the sermon tonight is Real Contentment. This morning we were looking at real life and uh, I, we, we just see here the contentment that Jesus has at the end of his life. Having gone through, been ravaged by the forsakenness of God, the wrath of God, for so long, here at the very end, we see contentment. And I, I want to show you how we see that contentment this evening. And uh, what I want you just to do is to notice what Jesus is committing into his Father's hands. Did, did you see that there in verse 46? He's committing his spirit into the hands of his Father. There's no safer place to be than in the hands of of a loving father and so Jesus commits the most precious man to have lived commits the most precious part of his being his human being that is his spirit into the most ple precious place there is the hands of the father I want you just to see that the spirit of Jesus is committed there that, let's just we're going to look at this idea of the spirit in a minute and see why Jesus committed his spirit there let me just say, this is his human spirit. This is not the Holy Spirit he's committing to his Father. This is his spirit. You and I, as human beings, we, we have a, a spirit. All right? And as I said earlier, on, your spirit is either spiritually dead or spiritually alive. You all, I included, we all have a spirit. And Jesus Christ, who was fully man, fully God and fully man, had a spirit. The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, rested uh, upon the Lord Jesus Christ to empower him in his ministry. It was the Spirit of God, the, 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 power, of the, the power of the Spirit of God that raised Christ to life again. But when the Lord Jesus Christ was raised bodily under the power of the Holy Spirit, his human spirit would have come back to him. Jesus Christ reigns in his body as a human being today. As we saw this morning, his resurrection was bodily and he will return to earth in his body. So when we talk about spirit today, we're talking about the human spirit, not the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And it's this spirit, his human spirit, that Jesus is committing to his Father's hands. The most precious person commits the most precious part of his human being into the most precious place, the hands of the Father. This is real contentment we're dealing with. Spiritual life is the place to be to find real contentment in all of life. The question that I, I had, you know, as I was preparing this, 
I was looking at this and I, and I, was, I was all ready to talk about the soul. Why doesn't Jesus commit his soul to his father's hands? Why does he commit his spirit into his father's hands? And does it matter? And it does matter. It, it does matter. It, the, the spirit and, and the soul in the scriptures, uh, just as in philosophy or anything like that, are very closely linked. But they are, they are different. They're different words in English. They're different words in the Greek language and indeed in the Hebrew language as well. The Bible tells us that we are, and th this is relevant because it, this is relevant to us it was as it was and is relevant to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's because he's risen, this is where it's relevant to Easter Sunday, because he has risen, he has a glorified body, which is the first fruits of the kind of body that we are going to have. So we're, we're looking at this Good Friday saying, this saying, just before Jesus died, in the light of resurrection reality. So the Bible tells us that as human beings, we are body, soul, and spirit. This is tripartite nature to, to, our, to our beings. You, you can find that in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Paul says, May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. So there's good news there for the Christian, the believer in the resurrected Jesus. There is the possibility in Christ, the reality, the, 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 the assurance that our body, our spirit and our soul will be kept pure because Jesus Christ has imputed to us his righteousness. So our body, well, we can comprehend our body easily, can't we? Because you can touch your body. What makes your body your body? What makes you physical? Well, perhaps it's the fact that you have five senses, don't you? You're able to see and hear, to smell, to taste, to touch. We get that, don't we? We don't have to be clever to, to be able to get that. Spirit and soul, that's harder to understand, isn't it? Remember what we're doing here. We're trying to work out why Jesus, the most precious man, commits his spirit into the most precious place rather than his body or his soul. And, and so we can understand what that has to do uh, with us. Spirit and soul are, are, are similar to each other, but they have different functions uh, in our lives as, as Christians. And uh, we see that uh, in several places. But again, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, a well-known verse, talking about the Word of God. It says there in Hebrews 4, 12, that the Word of God is, a, is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So one of the things that the Bible does is that it divides soul and spirit, really closely related, but it's the soul and the spirit. Why does Jesus commit his spirit into the Father's hands? And let me just say a couple of things about the soul. If you're a human being, you are, biblically speaking, you are a soul. You have a spirit, but you are a soul. The soul is the essence of who you are. The soul is the essence of a human being. The soul is what makes you you. And what we grasp and want and desire and long for in our church and in our town and across the world is that souls are saved. Amen? Because souls are so important to God. We want to see souls saved. If you are a human being, you, have, you are a living soul and you matter to God today. The soul is very precious to God. And, uh, well, I mean, there's just so many verses we could, we could have a look at uh, that talk about the soul. I'll just give you a, a couple. Matthew chapter 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. You, your, your body matters, sure, but your soul really matters. Your soul is eternal, it goes on. You are eternal, you will go on. 
either in heaven or, or in, in hell. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, I think, is the verse I'm looking for. Yeah, we know this one, don't we? What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? You might have a ton of stuff. You might be very rich, you might be very fancy, you might be very all together, but you can't take it with you. Your soul does not have the ability to take with you the stuff, the physical stuff that you have. It's the soul that matters, not the stuff around you. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? So where your soul goes in eternity is of vital and utmost importance. And to know the eternal destiny of your soul should be your number one priority. We're going to go to Christmas this Easter Sunday evening to try and help us understand the difference between the soul and the spirit. It matters because Jesus, the most precious man ever to have lived, committed his spirit into the most precious place, the hands of the Father, for eternal safekeeping. We're going to look at Mary, Mary the mother of Jesus. Mary, not the elderly lady who's mourning at the cross, who's now gone home with John. John's taken her under her care, but this young teenage girl who's kind of gone through scandal and uh, we're going to go to the song that she sang earlier on in Luke's Gospel. Luke chapter 1, I just want to read verses 46 and 47. As Mary comes away from the visit she has to her cousin Elizabeth, who is, uh, is, is pregnant with uh, John the Baptist. Mary says this, Luke 146, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. So you've got Mary there, bodily, <clears throat> excited. She's, she's, she's feeling the baby in her womb, she's alive, she's physical. <clears throat> but her soul and her spirit are involved. It says there that her soul, we're still looking at the soul, her soul, what's it doing? It's magnifying the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. But her spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. Your version might say that my soul glorifies the Lord. What does it mean to glorify God? Westminster Short Catechism has this famous question, doesn't it? What is the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. To, to magnify God, to glorify God, to give him the honour and the place due to his name. And Mary seems to be suggesting in this song that it is the soul's job to give glory to God. How do we give glory to God? How do we live to, to our chief end, to glorify him and enjoy him forever? There's so many ways we can answer what it is to glorify God, but scripture indicates that nothing we do delights God more than calling on his name with sincere hearts in full assurance of faith in the resurrected, living Lord Jesus Christ. We magnify, we glorify his power and his presence through the activity of our soul. The soul is precious. Human being, you are a precious soul. And you will live forever, heaven or hell. So why doesn't Jesus commit his soul to the Father's hands on the cross as he dies? Well, what else does Mary say? So her soul's magnifying and glorifying the Lord. Look at what her spirit is doing. Her spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. Remember the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God, that's what the soul does, and to enjoy him forever. You have a spirit, and what you need is for your spirit to be made spiritually alive, 
Why do you need to be spiritually alive this evening? You need to be spiritually alive in order that you might enjoy God forever. Your enjoyment of God comes through the activity of your revived soul. Your glorification, your magnification of God comes through the activity of, I beg your pardon, did I say that right? The, the enjoyment of God comes through your spirit, the glorification, the magnification of God comes through the work of your soul. It is the spirit of Mary that is rejoicing in God her Saviour. Now, apply this to Jesus on the cross. He has been forsaken by God. He has been left alone by heaven. Darkness has come over the land for three hours as he takes the punishment and the wrath of our sin upon him. He is utterly alone. He's utterly forsaken. He cries out, doesn't he? I thirst as he's drunk that cup of wrath. The cup we saw a couple of weeks ago, do you remember? That has your name on it. If you're a Christian, he drank that on your behalf. But now his spirit is rejoicing in his father. Jesus is surely committing his soul to the father's care. But it's his spirit that he places in the most precious place, the hands of the father. Yes, Jesus is glorifying God. He's been doing that throughout his life. For the joy that was set before him, he, he enjoyed the cross, scorning its shame. He, he, he did these things because of the joy that was before him. It was the joy that was before him, rising from the dead and bringing many souls home to his father. He's glorifying God, but here, at the end of his life, he is rejoicing in God. He's paid the price, he's endured the cross, he's despised its shame. And unlike the soul... It's the spirit, the human spirit, that expresses God's power at work in life. And it's, God, it's the human spirit for a Christian that expresses the power of God at work in death, bringing eternal life. So your soul magnifies God, but the enjoyment of God, the, the, the ability to rejoice in him is through your living spirit. To fully understand God's love for you. To fully understand God's power over you. To understand fully his grace and his mercy, his forgiveness to you. Friend, you need a living, spirit-filled spirit soul. Jesus, there on the cross, is using his spirit to rejoice in God the Father. And to express great love to his Father. Having been forsaken by God, he now experiences and enjoys the Father's closeness to him by committing his spirit to his Father. I've sat with three or four people, Christian people, who have been nearly dead. And, and I've told you the story many times about the man who was our eldest member, the longest serving me member, Cedric. And I've told you about my experience of sitting with him uh, on his deathbed, just leaving him a couple of hours before he eventually did die. He couldn't talk, his um, breathing was laboured and rattly, his mouth was fixed open, his eyes were uh, fixed open. It, you could tell he was pretty much all but gone. But as I was able to have the privilege of reading the scriptures to him, you can see from his expression that his spirit in death was rejoicing in life. Maybe you've seen that in Christian people who have been nearly dead. It's a joy to behold. It's a joy to behold a Christian funeral, to take a Christian funeral, to bury a Christian saint, to know that there's, they died with their spirit full of full of life. They may have been being persecuted, they may have been hideously ill, but because Jesus Christ died rejoicing in the life-giving love of his Father's hands, he died with a revived spirit as he went to be 
with his father, having paid for our sin. And, and, and you see it in Jesus, you see it in Cedric, you see it in Christians, the expression, the confidence, the assurance of the father's love, his embrace for the Christian, his open, welcoming hands is experienced through your spirit. So Christ knew that his spirit mattered. And Christian, I want you to know that your spirit matters. And if you're not a Christian this evening, I, I want you to know, perhaps even more than I want them to know, that your spirit matters. Because that without a spirit that is alive in Christ Jesus, you're, you're dead. You're dead. You're just body. The spirit's dead. As Jesus dies, his spirit is very much alive. And it needs committing as his body fails. It needs committing into a safe place. The Father's hand. Where are you going to commit your spirit, friend? Where are you committing the most precious part of your being for all eternity? May I commend with you the contentment, the real contentment that comes with knowing Jesus Christ as your saviour. Because your saviour's father is your father. You are adopted through Christ's death and resurrection into his family. You are brothers and sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ. I won't read, I was going to read these verses times, times about God. I, you can write these verses down. Only believers are spiritually alive. So later on you can check out 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 11. I've read Hebrews 4.12. You can check out James 2.26. There's loads of others. You can look at, actually, that passage in Romans shows the difference between life and death, doesn't it? But unbelievers are spiritually dead. Ephesians 2.1-5. Colossians 2.13. And Paul is clear that the spirit is, is pivotal to the life of a believer. You want to see how the Spirit is pivotal to the life of the believer? Check out, uh, well, again there, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You can go down to verse 14. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. Ephesians 1, 3. Ephesians 5, 19. Colossians 1, 9. Colossians 3, 16. The Spirit is the element of you and I that gives us the ability to have intimacy with God you, your soul is precious but your soul it seems to me through looking in the New Testament isn't where that intimacy comes from it's your awakened alive revived spirit if you don't know that intimacy with God through Jesus Christ this evening ask him to revive your spirit I want to just show you one more thing. If the spirit of Jesus was the most precious thing, of this most precious man, that he had to commit it to the most precious place, you need to understand that when you die and you breathe your last breath, that last breath is not wasted. You don't just become a wisp. Oh, here one minute, gone the next. You're... Spirit matters to God. That word spirit is the word pneuma in, in Greek or ruach in Hebrew. It's that word we use for breath. And it's interesting, isn't it, that the book of Ecclesiastes has an awful lot to say about breath and vapour, mist, and the meaninglessness of our breath. And the whole point the whole hypothesis of Ecclesiastes is that life, breath, is meaningless. Because we, we die, we, we're born, sorry, we work, we earn money to work, to earn more money, and we work. Life's just a cycle of meaninglessness. And it's like, it's what he says here in uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 21. He asks this question. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward 
and the spirit of the beast goes downward into the earth. Who knows? Who knows what happens to your spirit? Who knows if it's you're more important than an animal or not an animal? You know? Who, who knows? It's all meaningless. Christians know. Christians know what happens to the spirit. If you're a Christian, you, you're going to heaven. Uh, another verse from Ecclesiastes. We're, 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 we're then we're pretty much done. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. So he kind of gets to the end of his, his test, his experiment on the, the, meaning, the meaninglessness of life. And he, we think it's Solomon, don't we, right, in Ecclesiastes. And it seems to be the case that he, he comes around to realising there is meaning to life. There is purpose to, to life. And, and he says this in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, or the first part of verse 1. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. And then, he, and, he, and then he goes on, he gives a list of remembering the creator before loads and loads of things happen. But then he goes, uh, remember your creator in the days of your youth, down to verse 7. The dust returns to the earth, before the dust returns to the earth, as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Your spirit matters. Remember your creator now. You might not be a youth anymore. If you are a youth, remember your creator now. It matters, your spirit. If you're not a youth, then think youthfully. He's quite, he's quite insulting, really, is Solomon. He talks about before the silver cord snaps and we will start falling apart. And if, you, if you were here a few years ago when we went through Ecclesiastes, we, we saw that he was, he was being pretty brutal to uh, what happens to us as we get older. But before you, but, so remember your creator now, before the spirit returns to, the God, to God who, who gave it. Now, what does all this have to do with Resurrection Sunday? Sorry, I think I just said that was the last passage and then I'm, I'm, I'm done. There's, there's, there's two more and then I'm done. Terrible when preachers tell lies and say they're nearly finished and they're not. We don't do it on purpose. What does it have to do with Resurrection Sunday? It's life and death, isn't it? Is your spirit alive or is your spirit dead? Ephesians chapter 2. I gave you this to read, I think. This is one of the ones I said right down. Ephesians 2. Let me just read verses 4 to 6. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our tr trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So when you die, you'll be raised to life again. But when you become a Christian, the moment you become a Christian, your spirit is raised to life. Your dead spirit, your, your stony heart is replaced with a, with a fleshy beating heart. That's what this has to do with Resurrection Sunday because God raised Christ. We're, we're made alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. We've been raised up just as Christ was raised up. We've been raised up with him. Just as Christ ascended to heaven and is seated uh, at the right hand of God. So we'll be raised up and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's why Easter Day matters. That's why Easter Sunday is the best day of the year. Where are you going to commit your spirit to? You want to commit your spirit into the most precious place, just as the most precious man ever did. Into the hands of a loving father. John chapter 10, verse 29. My father who has given them, that's believers, to me. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So you'll commit your spirit to him when you die, but when you commit your life to Jesus, you, friend, you, you are safe and secure. No one can snatch you out of the Father. He's got you tied today. You want to commit your spirit to that one to whom we can call Father. But the writer to the Hebrews says it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. And it's a dreadful thing if your spirit is dead. So by the grace of God, I implore you, ask him to give you new life in Christ. To remove your hard heart. That hard heart of good works and trying your best. 
and giving you a fleshy, beating heart of love and grace, mercy, joy, forgiveness, redemption, and hope, eternity. Who are you going to commit your spirit to? The one who holds you tight in his hands? Or will he be the one who, for whom it is a terrible thing to fall into those hands? Don't make it the latter. Jesus is alive. It's possible. Absolutely possible. His arms are wide open. His hands are ready to receive you this Easter Sunday evening. Maybe you just need reminding of that. You've been a Christian many years and you're weary on the road and you need to just fall into the Father's arms this evening. Or maybe for the very first time today, you need to say, Father, into your hands I commit my life, my soul, and my all. Hallelujah. Praise God for the risen Jesus. Let's uh, stand and sing one more time together.
let's just stay standing a moment, just uh, have a moment of quiet, just to respond to maybe what God's been speaking to you about today. Maybe if you see the difference between your soul and your precious spirit, you might want to just ask God to revive your soul and your spirit. That your body would be useful in his service. That through the work of your hands, through the words of your mouth, the meditations of your heart, you might bring him glory, you might magnify him. And if you're not a Christian, maybe tonight is the night you want to just, for the first time, ask God to show you his goodness and love by renewing your spirit, making you alive in Christ. Maybe just in your heart you want to cry and thank you, Jesus. That you died and rose. That you're the victor. And maybe if your soul is weary and troubled. Maybe if there's no light in that darkness that you can see. My prayer for you is that what we've seen this evening will it help you to turn your eyes upon Jesus who in turn had turned his real contentment into the hands of his loving father. Jesus, thank you that because your father's arms are open wide, so are yours. Thank you, our friend, our brother, our Lord, our Saviour, our King. That as we gather, you're here. And your embrace is big enough to deal with all, all our days, all our worries and cares, all our life. Let's do that now. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And keep on, keep on leaning into him. Keep on doing that. Because it may be that the things of earth don't immediately grow strangely dim. That may take some time. But you're in the hands of a precious father today. He's good. And his love is steadfast and it endures forever. Praise his name. Amen. 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 Please take your seats. Lord bless you.